in the lazy man of, um, of getting someone certified. I was always opposed to it. Many nights I've been to uh, an election and the minute, literally the minute that the new board is, um, is elected, the manager simply gives them the form to sign. They sign the form and believe it or not, they are now certified and they've never read one word. So the other way of getting certified is by taking an educational class, which was approved by the DBPR. And there's so many topics that are, uh, that are covered by these classes. I've taught like 21,000 people all across the state that I've certified and it's my honor, it's a pleasure. And the truth is the people that really care about what they're doing, they can't get enough of it. They love it. And they wish there was actually more classes. The lazy people sign the form. And uh, it was always my contention that if you sign the form rather than taking a class, you don't even deserve to be on the board. You shouldn't get anybody's vote. Well, Senator Anna Maria Rodriguez, she asked me to draw up some legislation and she filed it on October 1st, uh, my proposed bill, which would require mandatory education. You cannot simply just sign that form any longer. And Representative David Barrero filed my bill in the House of Representatives and the, the bill numbers are before you. Okay, I can tell you that um, both bills have already each been before one Senate committee. The first committee passed at eight nothing, and the and the I just unmuted. I don't know. Have, have you guys been hearing me? Yes. Somebody? Yes. Yes. We can okay. hear. So it asked me. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can hear. Yes. You. Okay. So. Again, just to recap, the, the bill which would, would require mandatory education. You have to take an educational class within 90 days of getting on the board. It's been to two committees. One committee passes at eight nothing. The other committee passes at 17 nothing. And it's starting to proceed nicely in both the House and Senate. And the only thing I can say is I got my fingers crossed that, that this will actually pass. Um, the, the big changes, the big changes are going to come to the reserve laws. And as you know, for those of you that are on a condo, the way the current statute reads now, you are required, if you live in a condo, you're required when you do your annual budget to reserve for these three things, roof replacement, building painting, pavement resurfacing, and really anything else that's going to cost $10,000. There's a formula that you have to use, and the formula basically to simplify says the board members go to the roof and they determine how much time the roof has left. Let's say they say the roof has 10 years left and it's expected to cost $100,000 to replace. They know they have to reserve $10,000 a year towards the roof. Uh, they're going to divide that by 12 months. They're going to divide that by the number of units, roughly speaking. Now they know how much each unit owner has to contribute each month for the next 10 years so that in the 10 years, there's enough money to put on a new roof. And they got to do that analysis with not only the roof, but they got to do it with the uh, building painting and pavement resurfacing and anything else that's going to cost $10,000 or more. Now, the way it currently works right now, at the moment, you're not required to use any experts to use to uh, actually do your reserve study. So let's say you're lucky and you happen to live in a building where uh, the people on your board consists of a former engineer or a current engineer for that matter, a former uh, chief building official, uh, a general contractor, and they wind up getting elected on your board. And there could not be more qualified people in the world than these people to determine what your reserve account should be, right? These guys can go and determine what the real life expectancy is of your roof, what the real life expectancy is of your structure. Well, they get elected and they go up there and they say, 
prior board is crazy. The roof doesn't have 20 years left. The roof has at best two years left. This roof is in terrible shape. Same thing for the pavement, the same thing for the structure, right? And these are qualified people making these decisions. And they go back and they tell everybody, guys, I'm sorry, but the real numbers are much different. The, the prior board, you know, deliberately kept things low. And I'm sorry, but the real numbers say that we're way behind on our reserves and it's going to, our, our monthly assessments are going to go up $250 a month. And you know what typically happens when that happens? Those board members, even though they're the most qualified, they get recalled, right? The people that are living there actually recall them. And instead of those people making the decisions about the true life expectancy of your building, now you put back Sam, the cab driver, you put back Joe, the butcher, you know, et cetera. And instead of the qualified people making the determinations, you have unqualified people making the, these determinations. So understand that's where these laws uh, are, are going to be changed this coming legislative session, right? What do we know? We know that the members and associations like to waive reserves. A lot of people, especially in 55 and over buildings, take the position. So, so. We gotta, we gotta mute everybody. Sorry. Commissioner, you got it? I like taking pills. I don't like taking pills. All right, sorry. We have all been unmuted. If not, I'm just going to. Yes, I will. Right. Mute all. Okay. Uh, Eric, can you unmute yourself? And Representative Robina, can you can you mute, unmute yourselves? Ask to unmute. Ask to unmute. Got it. Perfect. Sorry about that. No problem. Eric, I'm sorry. Eric, you want to continue? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. here we go. All right, so let's go back to the slide where I was. I'm sorry. We were talking about waiver of reserves. So what do associations like to do, especially 55 and over associations? A lot of people feel that they don't want to put away money in a reserve account because in all candor, I might not be alive 25 years from now when we're putting money away for a roof that may need replacement in 25 years. And um, I'm, you know, I'm just not gonna do it. And therefore you have communities that vote down the funding of reserves year after year after year. So mm -hmm. there's never money uh, in the bank should repairs be necessary. And it's really very simple now to vote against the funding of full reserves. All it takes is a quorum to show up at a meeting, right? So a quorum in your building could be 40% in person or by proxy. And a majority of that quorum can vote for, uh, if given the choice by the board, a limited funding of reserves or no reserves at all. So really, if you think about it, it's possible that only 21% of your building, in some cases, can vote for no reserves at all. Mm -hmm. So the question is, in light of Surfside, right? The, the tragedy in Surfside, is that going to change this year? Are we going to continue to give people enough rope, quite frankly, to hang themselves with? Well, one thing I will say about Kathy fernandez Rundle is she likes to convene grand juries to investigate some condo problems. So about five years ago, when uh, I think, Julio, quite frankly, you, you, you're the one that kind of stirred the pot and raised the matter about condo crime being a problem in Dade County. That is and, correct. Yeah, and that caused Kathy Fernandez Rundle to convene a grand jury to investigate condo crime. And in light of that, there was a whole bunch of laws passed regarding condo crime. Well, this year she engaged a grand jury to determine what needs to be done in terms of reserves, taking care of the building, et cetera. Now I read the whole grand jury report the one line that stuck out with me that, you know, I feel like I'll never forget is, is this line that's in front of you. I told you, you know, you can waive reserves completely. The grand jury came out with this statement. 
we are at a loss to understand why such language would even be included in the Florida Condominium Act. Wow. That's a pretty serious line from a grand jury. Mm -hmm. I mean, a wow. very serious line. And at a minimum, if they said, at a minimum, if we're going to allow people to waive reserves or have less than full funding of reserves, we want a vote of at least 70% of the community in order to do it. Okay. Then they got into the 40 year recertification. And as you know, right now, as we, even as we speak, the 40 year certification process only has to do with Dade and Broward County. There's only two counties in the whole state Correct. that actually require it. It's pretty amazing. I always thought Palm Beach would come through and they would adopt it, but no, they never did. I was very surprised. So what are some of the grand jury findings? The grand jury found that, well, a lot of times the buildings get the notice that the 40 year inspection is, is up in the 40th year. And they're given like no time period whatsoever to comply. And they should be given a two year advanced warning. Why? So that you can bid the job for structural and electrical engineers. You can find out whether or not there's, there's problems if they recommend anything. If they do recommend fixes, you need to bid that job out to contractors. So they said it's unrealistic to give an association the notice in the 40th year, give them two years in advance. By the way, it's insane that the first time that a building gets looked at is 40 years after it's built. Think about that. A building official gives you a certificate of occupancy for your building. It could be on the water. And in Dade and Broward County, the next time it's seen by a professional, perhaps, is 40 years later. And in other parts of the state, it may never be seen by uh, an expert until parts of the building are already falling down. So the grand jury said, wait, the first inspection should be every 10 to 15 years. And it should be updated every 10 years. That's it great. Should, it should be done by a structural engineer. And if you're on the water, the grand jury recommended that you get a geotechnical engineer as well. Someone that could determine the subsurface and whether or not, you know, your building could be slipping and sliding underneath the surface. Um, they came up with you know, several other findings. Right now, I told you that the only thing that's required when you do your reserve study is roof, pavement, and painting. That's it, right? The grand jury said, nope, we're not going to allow that anymore if it was our say. We think the following things should be included in the reserve study. Roof, structure, fireproofing, fire protection systems, elevators, heating and cooling systems, plumbing, electrical systems, swimming pool or spa and equipment, sea walls, pavement and parking areas, drainage systems, painting, irrigation systems. Think about that. Think about all those things that would need to be included in your reserve study now. And think about what the cost of that would be. Think about the cost of the inspe what the inspection would be for all of these things. And then think about the, what would the cost would be if you had a reserve for all of these things. Then they said any engineer certifying a building in connection with the inspection must have been must have previously designed and inspected at least three buildings of the same or greater height as the building which is to be recertified. I will tell you this, you'll see a common theme throughout the, my presentation at least, that they want qualified or certified engineers and building officials. If there's one job that you should tell your children to go into right now, if they have you know, any uh, ambition for it, become a structural engineer because <laughs> there, there's not even close to the number of structural engineers that Florida will need if the, this legislation goes through. It's gonna Very be true. the greatest job that one could possibly have, okay? Again, mm -hmm. what else do, does the grand jury report? They felt that waterproofing, waterproofing causes a lot of problems to buildings. They heard some expert testimony. So they said building officials should require proof of waterproofing and painting 
every 10 years. Now, look what they said about board members specifically. A failure of condo boards to implement much needed repairs and maintenance has led to unsafe building structures throughout South Florida. Associations who don't comply with the insurance company's requirement of routine maintenance may result in the denial of the claim. So for example, you know, let's say you have a, uh, a roof that you know has been failing and failing and failing and failing, and you decide that you know, you're just not gonna fix it, and then you're just gonna put in a claim at some point. Well, if the insurance company can prove that you failed to mitigate your damages, right? You failed to fix it when necessary, they can deny the claim. They simply can deny the claim. So that's something that um, directors need to be very careful of. What else should building officials do? Building officials should check to see if the condo is actually performing the routine maintenance, right? Come around every once in a while. And condo board should be required to file a document certifying that regular routine maintenance has been conducted in the last 12 months. Picture that now, you know, um, presidents would have to put their name on the dotted line and they want the building insured for replacement costs. So many changes. What about false filings, right? If, if, Fake filings are done on behalf of association. You know, you get your friend, the architect or engineer to say that the building is simply fine. Well, any licensed engineer or architect who's found to have submitted a false misleading or fraudulent statement with any recertification, you lose your license for 12 months. If it's done twice, your license gets permanently revoked. That's what they're suggesting. Okay, so in response to this, where are we? So the Miami-Dade Grand Jury comes out with this report. So where are we? Is the Florida legislature going to adopt much of the provisions that the Grand Jury recommended? And there's a Senate bill called 7042, which has already passed one committee unanimously. And I can tell you this is the bill that will likely breeze through both the Senate and the House. This is the bill that everybody expects to breeze through. So just like what the grand jury recommended, what does this bill say? You don't just reserve for the roof pavement and painting. Now you reserve for the roof structure, fireproofing, fire protection systems, elevators, heating and cooling systems, plumbing, electrical systems, swimming pool or spa equipment, seawalls, pavement and parking, drainage, painting, and irrigation. Understand guys, this bill already passed one, um, one committee and it's going to pass, you know, in everybody's estimation, all others. Might there be some changes along the way? Sure, but I'm telling you, start thinking now what this would mean to your building, okay? Think of the additional costs that might start accruing. A reserve study would have to be done once every three years for buildings three stories or more in height. Right now, a reserve study uh, does not have to be done at all. And I'm gonna let Julio chime in here because Julio uh, in 2008 passed, drafted a bill that required the, not only the uh, a reserve study to be done, but to be done by a professional and Julio, maybe you want to tell everybody what happened with that. Okay, so that lasted about as long as the lobbyists got to it and were able to overturn it and remove it in another piece of legislation. Uh, again, I'm going to tell you it was done to safeguard uh, you know, the, these uh, communities, uh, the owners. But again, this is what uh, the lobbying core did to overturn it and have that removed was that the expense was such a burden on the buildings and then the owners that they couldn't you know, pay for it. So they got the legislature buried in another bill to remove the language. So it no yeah. longer exists, Eric. Disastrous. And your bill required it to be done right by experts. And now it could be done by, like I said, Joe, the cab driver, Sam. The yes, sir. It's, it's insane. It's actually insane. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the people that are doing the reserve study 
should not have a financial interest in the outcome of that reserve study because you know they're not going to want to find too many problems because they want to keep the assessments low. Now, what about waiving reserves? It's pretty complicated the way the bill is drafted, but the way it looks like if you don't want reserves included in your budget, you still have to go fund it in another manner, meaning like you're going to be able to borrow from a bank, but your reserve funds will be funded, period. They made it a little more difficult for the developer to waive reserve fundings in the beginning. The developer usually has the opportunity to waive reserve funds for the first two years. They address that a little bit. And sometimes you use reserve funds for purposes for which they weren't originally intended. For example, let's say uh, you needed your reserves to fix your roof, but you got the unit owner's permission to borrow from the pavement account because you were a little short. Well, now the statute says if you borrow from another account, that money's got to be put back after 12 months. Um, keep going. If the association is required to perform a reserve study and the budget does not fund, the budget actually doesn't fund the association's obligations consistent with that study, on the year-end financial statement, this is the language that has to be put there. The Board of Administration for this association has failed to satisfy the association's reserve funding obligations under Section 718.112.2F, uh, Florida. The budget of the association does not provide for fully funded reserve accounts for capital expenditures and deferred maintenance consistent with the association's reserve study. Failure to fund reserves consistent with the association's reserve study may result in unanticipated special assessments regarding those items. And by the way, new buyers, when they move in, are gonna be able to get a copy of your year-end financial statement. And when they look at it and see this language in it, they're gonna run, right? So gotta be real careful. Uh, what else is in the bill? A residential condominium that's three stories or more in height must have what's now called a milestone inspection. Keep that word, a milestone inspection performed by December 31st of the year in which they reach 30 years of age. This is going to be statewide, not just date in Broward. And it's based on the date the certificate, certificate of occupancy was issued and 10 years uh, thereafter, every 10 years. So 30 and then 10. Now, you know what is a milestone inspection? We'll, we'll get to that in a second, but a residential condominium that's three stories or more and is located within three miles of a coastline. Many of you that I'm speaking to tonight, I'm sure are sitting in beautiful condos right on the water, right? So if you're located within three miles of a coastline, you must have an inspection when the building reaches 20 years of age and every seven years thereafter. So it's gonna be a lot more expensive for people who live on the water. Their building's gonna be have to, uh, gonna have to be inspected um, by the time that their building turns 27 years of age, it's gonna be inspected twice where buildings off the water haven't even been inspected yet. So keep that in mind. So what are these milestone inspections? This mile, the milestone inspection is a structural inspection of a building by a licensed architect or engineer authorized to practice in the state for the purpose of attesting to the life, safety, and adequacy of the structural components of the building and to the extent reasonably possible, determining the general structural condition of the building as it affects the safety of such, bu of such building. Two things to take from this paragraph, okay? Notice it has to be done by a licensed architect or engineer. We don't, again, we don't even have close to the number of architects or engineers that we would need to do all these inspections, um, number one. Number two, notice that this statute, even if it gets passed, it doesn't require you to come up to the current code. That's not what this is for. So for example, let's say you're a 30 year old building and it's time to look at your electrical and an electrical inspector walks into your electrical room and he says, you know what, the, the, these guys have been great. 
They've been taking care of their panel. There's no rust. Some of the wires are new. I mean, their electrical panel is in wonderful shape. It's certainly safe. Well, guess what? You've just passed inspection. It does not mean you have to come up to today's code. It just has to mean your building is safe. Just keep that in mind. But let's say, you know, you go through, um, the, well, milestone inspection, again, it's going to consist of two phases. We'll go through one and two. For one, all you're doing is you're having a licensed architect or engineer perform a visual examination. Just take a visual examination of all areas of the building and provide an assessment. Surface imperfections such as cracks, distortion, sagging, excessive deflections, significant misalignment, signs of leakage or peeling of finishes. Look what it says, must be critically viewed as possible signs of structural distress. That's a pretty significant line because sometimes engineers will say, yeah, I see a crack here and there, but I don't consider it serious, move on. Well, this statute says, sorry, the engineer is not gonna have that discretion. If he sees any of those things, it must be critically viewed as possible signs of structural distress. If they find no signs of structural distress under a visual examination, phase two of the inspection would not be required. But I can tell you it's probably likely if you know, basically any sign of any cracks or any leakage is gonna result in it being called critical, a phase two examination is gonna to have to be performed. And the statute says phase two has to be performed if any structural, any structural distress is identified during phase one. The inspector has to be a licensed Florida engineer or architect Look at this, who so has a minimum of five years experience designing the primary structural components of buildings and a minimum of five years of experience inspecting structural components of existing buildings of a similar size, scope, and type of construction. Where are we gonna find all these qualified people? It's pretty crazy. Uh, phase two inspection can involve destructive or non-destructive testing at the inspector's direction. The inspection can be as extensive or as limited as is necessary to fully assess the damaged areas of the building in order to, con to confirm that the building is safe for its intended use or to recommend a program for fully assessing and repairing damaged portions of the building. How much do you think these inspections are going to cost now? Especially if you have to go into a phase two, right? You're already paying for a phase one. God forbid your first inspector comes back and says, I'm sorry, I, I have no choice. You have to go through a phase two. I, find, I found some cracks. I found some leaking. I'm not doing my job unless I tell you that you need a phase two. Now, off the topic, just for one second, you know, I can tell you that if, if remember all of this, of course, is based upon what happened in Surfside. It's a, it's a reaction to what happened in Surfside. And it's quite frankly, a lot of this is long overdue. Um, but um, I lost my train of thought for a second. But I can tell you that um, A, it's gonna be hard to find a lot of people to do this. And B, the expense that's related to it is going to be, you know, potentially, potentially, you know, astronomical for some buildings. And it's something that's going to be have to be included in your budget. You know, never mind reserves. You know, you're going to have to reserve. You have to be putting away money for these, the just the inspections alone. What do you think these inspections are going to cost? You know, potentially the the first inspection may only be ten thousand. I can tell you that if you live in a high rise building, the phase two inspection is not going to be ten thousand. The phase two inspection may be 50 or 100,000. So, and this is gonna happen you know, more often and more often. So just keep in mind how much more expensive it's about to be to live in high rise condominiums, especially ones that are on the water. And we're not talking yet about how much insurance has gone up. Uh, Julio, as a, as a, someone who's in you know, the business of working with 
community associations and doing their budgets. What in the world can you tell us is going on with just the cost of insurance? Well, I'll tell you that on the management side, we've seen 30 to 40% increases already. But the worst part is the lack of renewal and the threats of cancellations because a lot of these things, even though not enacted into law yet, Eric, is yeah. being requested up front. So that's pretty much the short answer to your question. Yeah, I mean, uh, and who's to say it's not going to go up 30 to 40 percent a year every year for the next couple of years? It all depends upon whether or not anywhere in the United States gets hit with storms. You mm -hmm. know, people think that uh, just because Florida doesn't get hit with a storm, it means that the rates won't go up. It doesn't work that way. The rates are really determined on whether or not almost any area of the country gets hit with any, with any uh, damage from hurricanes, any natural disasters. So keep that in mind. Um, phase one and phase two reports have to now be given to the local building official. And the local building official can prescribe timelines for the repairs. Okay, now think about it. The local building official was always able to sit back all throughout Florida. Th think about it. Always able to sit back and not do, not worry about your building whatsoever. Now, all of a sudden, they're going to be given all these reports. And I'll tell you what, what always bothered me was the, the, what building officials were always concerned about is, God forbid, someone that just moved into a unit is putting down a floor without a permit or they're moving an electrical outlet without a permit, or they're putting in kitchen cabinets without a permit. You'll have the building official and three of his, uh, his, his assistants with him, making sure that that unit owner gets a stop work order and a fine. But if on the way to that unit, they're passing you know, crumbling concrete in the garage area, it's ignored. So the building official is not gonna be able to ignore those things any longer because when these reports are done, it's going to be given to the building official. And, and I, I guess that what I want to go back to, as I said, I, I lost my train of thought before, and it had to do with the engineer that did the work for the Champlain Towers, Morabito Engineering. Now, what I will tell you is, if those of you who have kept up with the case, Morbido Engineering, time and time and time again, uh, placed in their reports that this building was dangerous. This building needed mandatory repairs. This building needed necessary repairs. But you know what they didn't put in their report? That if the repairs aren't made, the building is gonna fall down. And you know why they didn't put that in the report? Because really no building has ever fallen down. We've never really seen something like this happen before. But you know what you're going to start seeing in your uh, reports now? You know what you're going to start seeing when it's time for you to do these um, phase one and phase two reports? You're going to have language in your reports that say that they're going to cover themselves from now on. You know, uh, I can tell you that, that uh, Morabito is now sitting as a defendant in a courtroom based upon not putting in the, his report that the building could potentially fall. So now all these companies that come out to do your reports, you can rest assured they will be putting in your reports that failure to make these repairs can result in catastrophic damage, you know, words to that effect, including building collapse. So get ready for that, you know, to see that for the uh, first time. Um, what else does the statute say? The necessary maintenance, repair, or replacement of the association property. It isn't a material alteration or substantial addition. It does not require unit owner approval. And the association isn't liable for alternative housing costs, lost rent, or other expenses if a resident has to vacate a unit or is denied access to a common element for necessary maintenance or repair. Right, you got to move out for this repairs to get done. You got to move out. That's the way it is. And regardless of what the governing documents say, the board may not adopt. The, the board may adopt. I'm sorry, may adopt a special assessment or borrow money for the necessary maintenance, repair, or replacement of association property. A lot of you live in condominiums where 
in order for the association to borrow money, there needs to be a vote of the unit owners. Well, this statute seems to throw that out the window. Whether or not that's constitutional, we'll save for another day. But right now, when this passes, boards will be able to borrow money. Um, what about this? If the association has voted to waive the reserves or if the reserves are not being properly funded, it has to be disclosed in the estoppel certificates. Now, Julio, I got, this one for me, for me as an attorney, scares the hell out of me. Because when a unit is in collections, let's say in my office, right? And someone wants to know, uh, or someone's trying to sell their unit and the new owner wants to make sure the unit is up to date. So the unit owner says, okay, how much is owed on the unit? We're gonna bring it up to date at the closing. And there's a bunch of other questions to answer and we answer them. And I sign my name in my, you know, on the dotted line saying that this is what is owed and this is the, the, what's going on with the building. Well, now the law says that the estoppel certificates is, is going to have to say whether or not the reserve accounts are being properly funded or not. How the hell am I going to know that? I don't know that. So mm -hmm. I may be turning to the manager and saying, I need you to sign something separately that you know for a fact that the reserve accounts are being funded adequately. I don't know, how do I know as the attorney if every month the association is funding its reserve accounts? If that's something that's going to be required in estoppel certificates, but it's potentially a big problem for community associations. And the bottom line is an owner can take the board to arbitration for failing to comply with any of these requirements. So that's the, the grand jury report in a nutshell, and that is where the legislature is heading in a nutshell. And again, what I can tell you is there are pretty big changes coming. There hasn't, Julio, you know, there hasn't even been not one amendment filed to this bill, I believe, not one. So, so far, this, mm -hmm. is, this is proceeding full steam. I really think so far, at least, um, the bar is taking this seriously. And um, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to waive reserves going forward. There's no question there's going to be statewide inspections, phase one and phase two. And all I can tell you is, um, if you live in a condo, especially on the water, there's no way around it, not that I can think of, your assessments are about to go up. And if you, haven't, if you haven't been reserving, your expenses are about to go way up. I mean, really way up. If you've been reserving, you're in better shape. But I really pity you if you haven't been reserving because you're gonna have to come current pretty quickly, okay? So that's the bill in a nutshell. I mean, I'm not here to scare anybody. I'm just here to tell you where we're at. The legislature is not gonna let the, the unit owners continue to kick the can down the road. They don't wanna see another Surfside happen while they're a member of the legislature. And in all candor, I guess you can't blame them, okay? And Eric, that concludes my presentation, yes. Appreciate it. And I'd like to jump in because uh, people that are uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting need to understand that your job and my job is to tell them about the pros and cons of yeah. what is happening. We're not here. And we can't predict what the legislature will do, but I'm reading comments where people are saying, well, I guess it's time to pick up and leave, uh, trying to scare us to, to leave our condos. No, that's not our intent, but our intent is to keep you well informed of what may happen if this does take right. place, which will then segue into where I'd like to pick up with your permission, uh, uh, Commissioner. Um, right. First and foremost, again, uh, I, I will tell you that the, the biggest problem here is that this is what happens when things were neglected for years and nothing happened. Now there is this knee jerk reaction. But let me give you the other side of this. Eric, you did a marvelous job explaining it on what can happen and what is really moving and what is in legislation. 
But I want all the folks that are on this uh, meeting to listen to the following. I've been speaking to people in leadership in the House and in the Senate, and we don't see more things, more bills moving and other things happening because now the sentiment is that that all this stuff is as a result of a knee jerk reaction as a result of Surfside. And you, there might be some, you know, valid points. Some of these things are necessary, like the issue of the board members that they should have, of course, because that's where it all begins. Things like the situation of, um, of you know, having the reserve studies and, and have it done by professionals. But there is a lot of things that, uh, that are going to be considered knee-jerk reaction. And that's why a lot of bills are stalled. So this is for all of you out there that are nervous, wondering, oh my God, everything that Eric just explained to us that could happen, it's not necessarily going to happen. We're hoping that some of those things will take place, like the reserve parts, but you also can't cost, you can't get to the point where people can't afford any longer to live in a condo. I don't care if you're rich or poor, if all of this thing happens at one time, Eric, the condo industry, as we know it in Florida, is dead. I got, I got an issue. If you're living in a 55 and over community and you haven't been reserving for years and you're on a fixed income, Florida is not going to be known for the place to come to retire to. It's going to be known for the place to retire to and then get foreclosed on. Correct. I mean, it, I, it, that's the people that are the scariest to me. 55 and over communities that have never reserved. They're in huge trouble. Those are the ones that really have to be nervous because they're basically starting anew and that's, that's going to be right. a real tough situation for them. But that said, again, folks, I'm going to talk a little bit and I'm going to just leave you guys with a message. At the end of the day, why do we do this and why does the commissioner do this? Because remember who impacts these votes and these decisions, what is good for you, what's not good for you. It's everyone that's on this line that's looking here. I wonder how many of you have reached out to your Law, your lawmakers, meaning your Florida House representatives, your Florida House Senate, you know, you, you got to, I hate to use that slang word, you need to light them up. Well, you need to call the speak, get messages to the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, and our governor in Florida, and tell them this makes sense, this doesn't, I won't be able to live in these condos anymore. Because at the end of the day, these people work for you. I'm now talking about when I was in a position like this and these outrageous one lump bills would come out of nowhere instead of doing it gradually, but everybody had a knee jerk reaction. You know, you know who told us what they wanted? You did, the voters. You guys got to talk up. You got to talk to your senators. You got to talk to your representatives. I'll give you an example. When told by one of the people in leadership, Mr. Robina, it's a knee jerk reaction. A lot of this stuff may or may not pass. We don't know. And I said to them, well, some of it is as a result of Surfside, but I asked them, you know, what else do you consider? I got a bill that's fraud. The, the famous fraud bill that I've been pushing this whole session hasn't gotten a hearing yet. And they claim, well, it's a knee jerk reaction. My response to that was, is fraud a knee jerk reaction? To me, it's been around longer than anything that ever happened to Surfside. So there's the foolishness that goes on in the legislative process. We need to call these people and do something about it. This Senate Bill 7042, although it has great provisions, it's a lot. And you know that, Eric. It's a lot at one shot for any condominium to handle. If I were, even if I were a multimillionaire living in a condo and I had to take all that at one shot, I would be considering how am I going to sell this and get out of here yeah. right away. Solution? You got to get on the phone. You got to light them up. What I mean by light up is start calling your senator, call your representatives and call the leaders, the people that will allow a part of the bill to go through or they'll amend a bill or do something. Because if you don't defend yourselves now, I don't want to be in your shoes. I don't live in a condo. I don't own any property in the condo. And right now would not be something that I'd be thrilled to own at this time. You have to put some work into this process. Um, the grand jury report sounds like they took it verbatim from there and put it into that Senate Bill right. 70. I agree with you completely. It's almost verbatim. It's amazing. So that said, that will create, mind you, let me be careful with my words, such needed items that they are on board. And I agree with them. Unfortunately, 
you can't implement all of this stuff at one shot. So yeah. this is, you, you need to do this slowly to give the pocket, your money, a chance to catch up with this. And my last point, because I want to go to the questions, Eric, on the part that I commend you and you've been solid on it. And, and I want to thank, you know, the, the Senator uh, Anna Maria Rodriguez. Um, the, the, the issue on these uh, board members that they need to take a course and remove that lousy affidavit, which is a joke that they sign, that they claim they know statute. It all starts on the officers who run a corporation. If they know what they're doing, they'll make better decisions. Sure. I'm going to end with good news. I've been talking and they've agreed to create a course at Miami-Dade College, almost like they do a course for CAMS, the purport, a preparatory class for CAMS. They've agreed to do it at Miami-Dade College. It used to be Miami-Dade Junior College. As you all know, it's Miami-Dade College. We're hoping that that will become an example for all the rest of these community colleges, which used to be junior colleges, to create a model of that course and make it a mandate where board members can go, besides to a private sector uh, you know, offering it, to a place like a college and take the course and really come out of there knowing what their responsibilities are. I've always said, that it begins with uh, volunteers that don't know what they're doing. So what happens? You got a property manager. God knows what the intentions are. So the cart, as you understand, is, is, is guiding the horse. It needs to be turned around. I commend you. See, those is one of those bills that should pass with no problem because that's a common sense piece of legislation. Thank that you. said, again, I'll leave it to you. I'll turn it back over to you, um, Annabelle. We do need to, after we answer as many questions as we can tonight, and on the note that this session will be over by the end of next month. This is the time for you all to engage. You all have the ability to get on a Zoom meeting. That means you have the ability to send emails and start doing an Annabelle with my help and maybe with Eric's. We can provide a list of the emails for the Speaker of the House, for the Senate President, for your House members and, and, and Senate members and the governor of the state of Florida, because believe me, leadership listens to what he says. If he says this will go, it will go. If he won't, he won't. And if people make it known, hey, we can do this, but this is way too much at this point for us, they'll listen. Because when, when it comes election day, they respond and they'll be knowing who is the ones that are reaching out to them, telling them they got to do their job. That's take it from me. I was there. I've seen things even in the Terry Schiavo case. I'll never forget it. In, in less than a week, where there was no support for something, something immediately was done. And finally, there will be a train bill. I'm sure that might be this Senate Bill 742. There will be one bill that will carry whatever leadership agrees to, and that's going to be the one that's going to run all the legislation. You need to continue being on these meetings, and you need to get engaged with the elected bodies. That's what I'm Thank hearing you. about this bill, that this might be the train, number one. Uh, number two, you know, we've been living in such a, a bull market when it comes to real estate prices, especially in South Florida. And I can't imagine what it's going to do to the if, if this bill went through in full all at one time. I can't imagine what it does to the condo market. You know, I think it's going to be devastating to the condo market, potentially. That, I think that'd be a great question for Danielle Blake and people in the real estate industry which again, they're trying to work and make it good for everyone that owns plus for affordable, you know, uh, selling and buying of condos. But I'm sure they would agree that this is just way too much. It's an avalanche coming at everybody. It's a, at one it's a great word. It's a lot at one time. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. it, it, at least since I'm, I'm practicing 30 years, I've never seen so much change at one time that would cause, you know, truly dramatic difference in people's lives, you know, in, in, just, in just how much money they spend every month, what they can afford. It's going to change the way they live. It's going to change what they eat, perhaps, just to stay in their condominium. And I'm not exaggerating by that. That's how much money we're potentially talking about. Eric, yeah. uh, we have a lot of questions and comments, and I'd like to get to them. Um, but first, I, let me say this, my apology to you and to Julio, I, you know, you have been really instrumental in advocating and doing work on, for free 
you've come on these meetings time and time again. Um, Representative Urbina, you know, has helped me for four years. I'm a commissioner in Hallandale Beach, yet we've opened this up to all of you. It doesn't matter if, where you live. If you're in Florida and you're a condo owner, you're welcome. So I am sorry for a really inappropriate comment. This is not that kind of a forum. And if you think that anyone is trying to scare you, then this Correct. is not. This I, is, I have this no is idea. What, a, I have no yeah. idea what comment you're talking about, but. So, but that, that person, if that person's on here, if you think that this is, no one's asked you for money, no one's asked you to list your property. It's inappropriate, nope. it's negative, and I will not tolerate it at these meetings because you all have given me hours and hours of your time for mm -hmm. years. Um, the only reason that we have the ordinance in Hallandale Beach, which I think now Miami-Dade um, is looking at, is because of the work that, especially you, um, Julio, and then Eric coming on. So my apology, no one's asked you for a penny. I will not tolerate that um, again. So. Having said that, um, I would, if it, both of you uh, would be so kind, I'd like to get to the questions because we received sure. quite a few of them and I know people are hanging on to get to them. So um, let me say this, I do not, I will not say your name. So whoever sent that in, you'll probably know it's your question, but um, I'll tell you one of the reasons that we don't use names here or names of associations is it really for protection for your own protection so that your board members don't sue you for defamation and so forth. So you never have to worry about me using your name unless you ask me to. Um, and we never ever use names of association. So here goes. Um, what are the alternatives, if any, besides recalling the board of directors that unit owners have when the current BOD is doing the minimal necessary work to pass the 40 years uh, certification. This was clearly stated by the engineer contracted to determine the scope of the work necessary to be done and to oversee the project. And it was approved by the BOD, Board of Directors. Well, right now, as long as that structural engineer and electrical engineer signs off, that's it. If you believe that you know somehow it's a forgery, Remember I said, you know, if it's done as a favor to someone on the board, the grand jury recommended that they lose their license. Mm -hmm. well, I guess you can take that report, walk it over to your local building official and say, you know, I, I understand that the stru structural elect or electrical engineer signed off on this. Please, please, please take a look for yourself. There's no way that this building is safe and ask them to go out. And if the building official finds that, that the engineer was lying, you know, heads are gonna roll. That's the answer right there. I get this question 20 times a month. I tell people, don't trust anybody, call the county or call the city and report it. They are now coming out, as Eric said before, they drive by this stuff and wouldn't give it a second glance. If you call and you say this building has structural issues, they don't care who it is, somebody will come out, believe me. I've given that advice to a lot of people in Dayton Broward and the officials are coming out. Okay, great. Uh, by the way, uh, this uh, is being recorded. I have given you guys a link to my Facebook page. I'll post it on Facebook and also on the YouTube channel. Um, and then at the end, we'll follow up for the next meeting and the resources that Julia was talking about before. Okay, next, to discuss our concerns of the upcoming assessments, uh, we want to go to the board with our concerns. However, we need to be educated and to know how to approach them tactfully. So this uh, is a bit of a paragraph, but bear with me. The upcoming assessments are for buildings, reconstruction balconies, impact windows, and painting the building. Over a year, they started working on the back of the buildings, 1301, 1350. We have six buildings on the island and are still not completed. In September, they collected the assessments for the building and they still have not begun the work. Plus no permit has been given, given to building 1101 as of yet. We were given some indication that our buildings will be given assessments very soon, but there is no confirmation on that yet. And if we do get uh, assessed now, it seems that the work will not start for at least another year if we are lucky. 
Um, the following are some of our concerns. So let me just say there's a group of, um, this is not in Hallandale Beach, uh, and there's a group of residents uh, that are on this Zoom specifically for these questions. So, right. okay. Uh, so these are the following concerns and questions. If we do have an assessment soon, why do we need to pay so early when clearly they will not be working on our building for at least another year or so? Anybody want to take that? Well, I, you know, Julia, you, you're best to answer that. You know, I, 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 I can answer that. Yeah. yeah. And, and Eric, you, I, you know what we can do? Eric will give you a legal opinion on it and understand. I can give you more since we're in the, the management business also. I will tell you, unfortunately, these special assessments, if you apply it to these communities all in one shot, most of these people end up in collections and they can't pay. So what do most boards do? They want to go ahead and extend it, the payments for a year or two years. But they, you understand that when you extend a, a payment plan that long, it might take six months, eight months before you even get enough money for the down payment to get the work done. So that's why people wonder, well, why? Why is it that we started paying it last month and it's going to be a year before you even start it? It takes a while when well, you've been given the opportunity to pay it slowly. Eric, you want to jump in? No, and you're right. And the workers obviously won't start the work without a significant down payment. And if you don't have it, you know, you're going to be just sitting with a broken down building. So you're right. Most boards, most boards try. I can honestly say most boards try to make it, um, you know, tolerable to pay the to pay the huge assessments. They do whatever they can. And I'll tell you one thing: um, money is cheap right now. You can borrow money from a bank in the you know three and a half percent range. So a, what a lot of people are opting for, a lot of associations are opting for, instead of just passing a, a, you know, a special assessment and hitting everybody, uh, requiring them to take large sums of money out of their personal accounts. Borrow money from a bank and pay it back over 10 years at 3%. You know, it's happening. Let me, and let me jump in there. So money right now, the interest rates are low. The problem is banks are not loaning. They're really requiring so much more than ever. And that's a huge problem that we're having now talking as a management company. We will tell you, Eric, we're, they're, they're not loaning because they have too much delinquency. They don't have reserves. Yep. So they're denying. We're actually now... I'm gonna share this for the first time in a Zoom meeting. We met with an organization called Y Green. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of that, Y Green. Y Green for the first time ever is finally working out a program to be able to loan money to associations. And I'm talking about for the entire building. So we're looking at that. And of course, as you know, we've talked about this before, hopefully the feds will step up and come up with some type of low income uh, you know, federal funding that may be available to buildings that are going to be looking at, at, at substantially high, you know, special assessments and costs, because unfortunately, the banks are not loaning. We're, we're having a heck of a time trying to get loans for buildings, especially the older ones, 40 plus, because they just don't, they don't have the reserves, they don't qualify. So that's the problem that we're having. And along those same lines, Julio, it's becoming a lot harder to get individual mortgages uh, if, if they're FHA back. It's like becoming impossible. Uh, no more than 15% of the building can be in arrears. And um, they have to have reserve studies. The reserves have to be funded. It's going to be so on top of everything we just spoke about, it's becoming very difficult, much more difficult now to get an FHA backed mortgage. That's an, an, another problem to worry about. Uh, I will continue on with the questions. I see those of you that are asking questions in the chat box. Um, we'll get to those uh, in a little bit, but we do have questions that were submitted to us by the 5 p.m. deadline. Um, let's see. Building 13 and 11350 were added an additional bill due to insufficiently budgeting removal and other charges. Are they paid after they paid their assessments? How can we avoid that? Also, can we request and or demand an, demand an inspection report? Okay, so a lot of times what happens is there's change orders. And Julio, I apologize if I stepped on your toes there. Nope, go you ahead, jump on in. Eric. certainly could have answered that. Happens all the time. You know, there's a, a, a um, 
contractor will give you a contract. And then all of a sudden they'll tell you that, well, we started dig, uh, fixing the balconies and it turned out that the rust from the, you know, the rebar doesn't just extend out into the balcony, it extends into the person's living rooms. So we got to dig much, much deeper. Therefore we're doing a change order and it's additional $400,000. And this happens, you know, routinely. So when you budget for a job, you better budget at least, you know, 20% more. So Julio, I apologize if I stepped on your toes there. Not a problem. That's exactly what I would have said anyway. So we're good. Okay. Can we request one, can we request and or demand to see bids? Also, how many bids is the minimum? We do not even know if the board of directors received more than one bid. And Eric, we you, have a yeah. Eric, you want to start it? And I also want to yeah, explain sure. to them what we meant and legislatively and how the bid process should go. But go ahead, and I want to explain. So in a that. condo, anything that's going to cost more than 5% of the association budget needs to be bid out. It says it needs to be engaged in competitive bidding. Uh, the statute never defined competitive bidding. So competitive bidding could be two bids. Most people say it's three bids. And even if you engage in competitive bidding, the statute does not require that you accept the lowest bid, okay? It's, it's choosing the most qualified person to do it for the best price. That's what you're looking for. Julio, all yours. Yeah, let me step in. So this bid process that we all wonder, is it being manipulated? Is it, is it being, you know, uh, fraudulently done? Are there kickbacks? Do you know that when we wrote the legislative intent to that, a bid process is done in a very simple and in the following way. They do a scope of work. That scope of work is then sent out to contractors so that everybody bids apples for apples. And then when they come in, do you know that those bids should be sealed at all times? The property manager should not be opening it. The board members should not be opening it. And this is the way we practice it. You know, when we find out what's been submitted is a day when we do a meeting and that day there's those sealed bids are opened with so that it's the first time that the property manager sees it, the board members see it and the homeowners see it. That's the only way you take out the manipulative way that bids are nowadays, because there's not a person on here that will disagree with me that they know that if you've got a friend, you tell them put in a bid and you're, you've got access to what everyone submits, there's a way to manipulate that. And that's where this thing goes south. Oh, so, come on. That never happened. Not in South Florida, <laughs> never. <laughs> anyway, wanted to share that with you. So if your group or your association isn't doing it that way, that raises a flag. You, know what, you know what, Julio? Because of what you, what the, those concerns that you had just a few years ago, that's why mm -hmm. the Florida condominium statute was changed to now have a conflict of interest statute for the first time. So now if this, the president's son-in-law is giving a presentation in front of the board to try to get a job, he has to disclose that he's the son-in-law and the president has to disclose that he's the son-in-law. And if the president doesn't disclose it, for the first time in history now, board members can remove board members for failing to disclose a conflict of interest. Okay, so no more funny business. Incredible. Okay, to go on, uh, do we have any break discounts on hurricane windows? There was mention of Governor DeSantis signing this. Are we eligible? Assuming there is a contract for work, can they give an assessment without us reviewing or signing a contract? Let me, let me jump in on, is there any discounts for hurricane windows and stuff? Remember the company I just mentioned, Y Green? Mm -hmm. I mean, people can call me. I'll go ahead and give them the information. Y Green does all of that. They'll do roofs, they'll do uh, impact windows, they'll do everything. And, uh, and they also are now, like I said, preparing to loan money, um, but they are turnkey, any type of work that needs to be done in the community. They're the only ones that can discount. And at the same time, I'm not aware of anything now. I know that our county had some incentives, but it was for people with disabilities and for, I don't remember the people that were designated um, but the state does every so often years ago, they had a program with, I don't know how many millions that were funded to match people 
uh, but I don't believe it applied to condos. Derek, do you have any knowledge of? No, no. Where you, where your where your savings might come in is that if you agree to hurricane proof the whole building, you know, you live in an old building, and all of a sudden in one shot you agree to hurricane proof the whole building, your insurance company good may point. give you a substantial discount in your right. windstorm yeah. coverage. Yeah, that right. could happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Assuming that, uh, can they, assuming there is a contract for work can they give an assessment without us reviewing or signing the contract and there's going to be another assessment coming soon for landscaping and restoring the gatehouse and bridge. There is mention that, will, that it will be an assessment of 2000 per unit. I and probably many from another buildings have one assessment for the roof that I, that I will still have for the next three to four years. Is it legal to give more than one assessment, let alone three at the same time? Happens all the time. Ha happens all the time where there's several, mm -hmm. several assessments run into each other because, you know, uh, and, and this is again, oftentimes because you didn't have a reserve account to fall back on. So you're just continually assessing and assessing and those assessments now are on the books for years and years. Mm -hmm. If there was a reserve account to fall back on, maybe you wouldn't have had to keep going through those uh, assessments. So what would your advice be to for this particular group of condo owners in approaching the management company and BOD uh, in a tactful manner to try to resolve this? I don't know that it'll help much, but you know. You know, we, we use the word resolve the board is in a tough spot. You know, I, I want you to think about what it was like to be, may they rest in peace, a board member for Champlain Towers South, okay? The job, uh, Morbido comes out and says, okay, he needs millions of dollars worth of work. They start discussing, right, uh, with, the, with the community. The community is outraged that it might cost, you know, eight, nine million dollars. Wow, we got to, we should shop around. We should bid around. All of a sudden, in the middle of all this, COVID sets in. Okay, now we're going through COVID. Morabito is still coming out and saying, you know, just because we're in the middle of COVID doesn't mean that you can ignore what's going on with the building. And the price gets to 15 million dollars. Okay. And they have to stand in front of their building now during COVID and say, guys, I don't know how to tell you this. I know some of you may have had your businesses closed, but um, I need $100,000 per unit and we need it in one shot. So, you know, you say approach a board tactfully. The board has a job to do. And if you don't have the guts to do it, then don't do it. I mean, Julio, I'm, I, you know, both of us, both yep. of us, I'm sure, say that to people all the time. You're in all a tough spot sometimes. I understand you don't want to hit people for money, but if you don't, a building can collapse. Does everybody understand that now? You know, unfortunately, yeah, now we understand it. So, you know, tact or no tact, the board has to do what has to be done. And this goes to me to the comment that this is the times that there has to be cooperation and total transparency. At the end of the day, you all are neighbors. You need to sit down and you need to work it out. Uh, if not, it could end up in a receivership. And that you don't want. You're going to have one individual making the decisions and he's going to spend every penny, but he's going to move quickly. He's not going to consider your pocket. So you don't want to end up there. So there's where you guys need to sit down. But again, I've always said, if you got one of those boards that that works in the dark, as you know what I mean, that they do things and they're not in transparent and they're not communicating, the first thing you all need to do is try to get rid of them, do a recall and get rid of them, try to bring people that will bring back that transparency uh, in order to be able to see where you stand. And unfortunately, as Eric said, you've got to make some tough decisions because what's happening in Dade County more, some board members cared more about being recalled or voted out than to do what they needed to do. And you know what it cost them? Forget the sadness of Champagne Towers. We got a lot of buildings that were closed Absolutely. and the people were thrown out. Within four hours, they had to pick up their belongings and leave. 
county government and city government has the power to do that. And if this bill that we're talking about actually passes, there's going to be little to no discretion that a board even has. There is no bargaining position with the board. They're stuck. Their hands are going to be tied. They're going to have to do what they have to do. Julio, any any uh, word back? I know that you had um, conversations with Congresswoman uh, Wasserman Schultz for federal aid because uh, I think a lot of seniors are going to be in in need for some financial relief. Well, at this moment, there's been nothing new that we've heard back from our congressional Shocking. delegation. <laughs> Shocking. So nothing at all. It's been, it, they know it. Every one of them has been versed and understand the need for this Florida low, uh, low in, uh, we'll call it low uh, interest loan for condominiums. For, and by the way, this is for the entire state of Florida. Great idea. They all thought, you know, it was a great idea. Nothing has happened. This is why we're looking for alternatives. Because as I said, the banks are not cooperating. Um, this company came out of nowhere. We've been looking for our own clients to find them some funding. Um, it's hard. Nobody wants to loan because, and by the way, here we go again. We're not trying to scare everyone. This is the reality of what's really happening. So nobody wants to loan money because think about it. If you were a lender, if you were a bank, would you like to loan money in such uncertain times, especially when you don't even know what the actions of the legislature is going to be? Yeah, that's that answers everyone's question right there. Totally Clarification agree. on engineered life safety system. Here's what we understand so far with regards to retrofitting ELSS. Our association has a certified certified by the DPPR vote from 2016 to forego the retrofitting of ELSS with a sprinkler system. Then they make reference to uh, FS chapter 718, the local authority having jurisdiction may not require completion of retrofitting with a fire sprinkler system or an engineered life system before January 1st, 2024. In addition, in addition, in the same chapter, it states, notwithstanding a residential association may not be obligated to and may forego the retrofitting of any improvements required by 553.509 upon an affirmative vote of a majority of the voting interests in the affected condominium. Right. I don't remember. And Julio, if you, if you do, please um, chime in. Well, I'm going to give it to you in layman's terms. They got really? to 2024. You can't be forced to retrofit. Let's just try to explain it that way. Yeah. However, that all may change because these are life safety issues that are being looked at now as a result of Champagne Towers. Um, that may go out with, uh, as I said, with the baby's bathwater yeah. if these changes take place. Because think about it. If you're trying to make buildings safe, but you're then going to have a piece of legislation that's extending a life safety measure that's been given life, let's say the ability to stick around till 2024, that's counterproductive in what they're trying to do. So right now, I'm gonna tell you what we have. We got till 2024, I've got buildings that are every time that the legislature keeps extending this retrofitting, because this has been going on since I was in the legislature, um, they're, they're very nervous because the cost of that, Eric can tell you, yeah. is in the millions of dollars to retrofit these old buildings. And it's a lot of work to put in these uh, sprinklers. So, but again, here's the uncertain times of what is going to be done by the legislative body. Because what kind of message do you send? Let's get these buildings to be safe, but don't worry about the fire component. Right. Doesn't make any sense. I remember standing in many a legislative hearing where the fire department would come in and beg the Florida legislature, please, make condominiums put sprinkler systems in so we don't have to run into a burning building. We have some help from the sprinklers. And an amazing thing happened actually. Um, and it, unfortunately it was attached to a bill that I had going that I wanted to pass. Remember that fire in London, the, where the residential fire in London a couple of years ago, where many, many people died? Mm -hmm. Well, the bill in Florida to do completely do away with the need to um, even do an engineered life safety system, that 
the fire in London happened while that bill was sitting yet unsigned on Governor Scott's desk. So the fire happens, all these people die. Governor Scott looks at this bill and says, you want me to sign this now? Are you crazy? And he vetoed the bill. So it would have required these uh, engineered life safety systems by a certain date, but no, instead it's getting kicked down the road again, just like reserves. Which brings me to the point of the power of people contacting your lawmakers. Folks, if you can continue, people have put pressure on their lawmakers since the that, that, that 20, to, since 2002 that I was there and they were able to extend this by asking, please extend it, keep extending it. And the pressure as a voter, let me tell you some of the emails that we would get. If you vote to, uh, to move forward with this and not to extend, we will vote you out of office. Those yeah. are the kind of emails that people were sending and look what happened. It kept getting extended. Here's 2024 and it's still extended. So the pressure that you all put on can make a difference on all of these things that we've spoken about this evening. So Julio, if, if what we're saying is correct, so in addition to everything we spoke about tonight, for high-rise condominiums, meaning I think it was above, what, six stories, they're also going to have to deal with the engineered life safety system requirement. That's correct. Wow. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what's potentially facing condominiums. And folks, remember that the firefighters are not the bad guys here. They're not evil. Yeah. They're trying yeah. to do a job. They're trying to keep you safe. And it costs money to retrofit. So we don't, we don't take a negative stand to them, but it's almost like, you know, they've got to put it out there. That's their job to keep us safe. We have to decide, you know, whether, when I say we, the legislature has to decide whether they're going to put that financial burden on you right now, or are they going to take a chance? And as Eric says, keep, keep kicking the can down the road. Uh, that's what this boils down to. All right, so I hope, hopefully that answers and clarifies for this group of residents, our condo owners. I missed it, gentlemen, um, the question about whether it's legal to retroactively charge the owners for the maintenance fees for scheduling mistakes made by board of directors and the management. I, I missed the oh, answer to that. So, so may, I don't know if Julio saw the question. So sometimes, Julio, the, the budget is passed a little late like mm -hmm. uh, it'll get passed in December and the coupon books are not in sync with the way people are supposed to pay. So they'll ask somebody to pay like um, a certain amount in January, then double for February or, you know, one and a half times in February so that it eventually starts to work out. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. So is that legal? Yeah. In my opinion, I certainly think it's legal just so that, it, so that it, it it's, it's re basically retroactive for one month or so. And I, I don't think uh, any court would have a problem with it at all. It just makes it so that it's the same payment basically for the rest of the entire year. Okay. We're in agreement. Um, how do you look up receivership in Miami-Dade and Broward counties? That's one for yeah. Eric. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, there's, I don't think there's no way to specifically look up. If so how do you know? So how does somebody know... Uh, Let's say Jade wins in on Miami Gardens Drive. How would somebody know in that building if they're building? Probably a once a building goes into receivership, I can guarantee you that there's a an order by a judge that's recorded in the public records of Dade County. Let's say for Jade wins, that'll say this building has been placed into receivership. The receiver shall have the following powers. So I'm sure an order like that will get recorded in the county. So how does went so they go to the Go to the official records of the county. You can do so online for any county. Type in the name of the association and up will come the latest documents. But, you know, receivership is few and far between. That's the reality. Out of, you know, tens of thousands of associations, you know, far less than 1% ever wind up in a receivership. So I know we have uh, a good number of realtors on here. So the question of follow-up to that question is, um, can a condo be sold if the building is in receivership? Uh, and does the seller have to disclose to the buyer that the building is in receivership? <laughs> so, Eric, yes, go ahead. You could have yes, that. A, yes, a buyer can buy a unit that's in receivership 
They should probably also immediately seek psychiatric help right after that too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> does it have to be disclosed? Believe it or not, I don't think there's anything on the estoppel certificate, Julio, right now there's that says that yeah, that says the is this building in receivership? No, not yet. So that's for the that's for some of my uh, my fellow realtors uh, on here. Okay, uh, a couple more questions. Condo boards and attorneys. Is it legal for a board president to be the only one to speak to the condo attorney? And if so, then how is a corrupt president ever challenged legally by another board member? Good question. Great question. Okay. So why do boards do that? Because, you know, let's say you have a big board and you have nine, 11 members on the board. You don't want everyone calling the attorney because in all candor, it's going to get expensive for the association. So it's not uncommon for an association to limit the amount of people that can talk to the attorney. Very, very common. However, that being said, let's say they all say only the president and the vice president can talk to me, right? If I get an email that says, wait a minute, Eric, I know I'm not allowed to talk to you, but please read this. I have proof that the president or the vice president is doing X, Y, and Z. Believe me, I'm going to be discussing that with the president or I'll call an entire board meeting immediately, a closed door board meeting immediately. So don't think that just because you're not allowed to talk to the attorney, if you come forward with some sort of allegation that there's stealing or fraud going on, that attorney better look into it or it's going to be on that attorney. So I guess yes. for the follow up on that, is it the responsibility of the condo attorney hired by the Absolutely. association Absolutely. to inform the BBPR and condo president and or board members uh, if that they're violating the association's bylaws? So if it's really happening, there's a, certainly an obligation to investigate. And if it's found to be true, yes, to take the necessary steps. Absolutely. And let me jump in. So um, the, 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 uh, the association attorney will get involved in these things. But remember, he works for the entire board, but by rule of thumb or courtesy, because of these big boards, you normally designate one person. However, you just mentioned, because I can see where this group is going with their line of questioning, is if there's fraud, well, you can report it to DBPR, but here I go again, I'm gonna get up on my can here. Yeah. There is, DBPR is not gonna deal with fraud. We're hoping that a fraud task force be established this session, which doesn't look like it's going anywhere yet, so that that it will go through FDLE, which will investigate fraud. So that question, um, I just wanted to make clear, you waste your time with DBPR if it's a fraud issue, they're not gonna get involved. We need this to be done. And by the way, in that uh, grand jury report, they actually support 100% the creation of this condominium fraud task force. And they even gave the bill number, which is strange because this year mm -hmm. they were very articulate in that grand jury report because even the prosecutors, meaning the state attorney, I've spoken to the one in Dade, the one in, in Monroe County, they say that unless we get this fraud task force up, people are under the, the impression that the state attorney does the criminal investigations. They do not. They need local, local police departments, economic crime units to do the investigation, arrest people. And what they do is they prosecute folks. So that's why we're not getting arrests. Just wanted to take that opportunity. Somebody gave me the opening. I wanted to slip that in there. Well, <laughs> we need more, we need tougher, tougher laws. I just, you know, well, we'll discuss that another time. Uh, has the association, uh, right to change the declaration does the association have the right to change the declaration after 40 years the association had an offer to sell part of the condominium elements uh such as parking garage i know that 100 percent of the unit owners must agree the actual board thought to have it changed with 66 percent of the unit owners vote uh, generally generally speaking if uh, something requires a hundred percent vote right you can't amend the declaration with a 75% vote to bring down the 100% number to something less. So if something requires 100%, it requires 100%, period. If that makes sense to you, I hope it does. I hope it makes sense to the individual as well. <laughs> you um, can't, if something requires 100%, right? You can't amend the declaration with a 75% vote 
to change that provision that requires 100% to something less. That's, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go over to the chat um, box now and look, I, I've not been able to read all the um, questions. So if any of them are off topic or not appropriate, we'll just move on. Uh, let me see. Oops, I lost the window. One moment, please. I'm going to try to go back up so that we can get to everyone's questions. Thank you, extremely important and very informative. You're very welcome, Teresa. Um, the Surfside tragedy was not caused solely by the owner's negligence or lack of studies. The state DBPR should be responsible. I, I think people really don't understand the DBPR's no. rule. Right. Uh, as the 2008 grand jury report forwarded them of the fraud against the owners. Those are millions lost for the past decade that the state refuses to prosecute fraudulent associations and attorneys and association management, plus selfish directors. Surfside had nothing to do with uh, an, a, a board that was corrupt. Quite frankly, just the opposite, probably just a board that was afraid to ask for their, the owners for millions and millions and millions of dollars during the coronavirus crisis. So it took some guts to actually ask them when all was said and done. And, and they did, and he, some actually cut a check for like a hundred grand. My, my only comment on, on, uh, on Surfside is simply that you had two paid professionals with all respect to Eric as an attorney, but the two people or the two professionals that were hired was a property manager with a license that should have been guiding them because they're volunteers again, not really understanding and the attorney for the association. Um, that's why I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they're all named in the lawsuit that's sure. currently being filed by Silva and Silva, you know, against the attorney for Champagne Towers and the property manager. Of course, there'll be other people, I'm sure, like the uh, engineer and so forth. It's a, it's a huge lawsuit. But again, those are, if you pay professionals to guide you, professionals need to do their job. Uh, Jean Claude says most of condo associations are in financial difficulty. How and where can they borrow money for 10 to 25 years? This is heartbreaking because I don't know that there are very many options out there. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't generally see anything for, you know, like 25 year loans. But what I'm seeing now is like you can get locked in for like three to five years. Typically, uh, what they do is they give you an open line of credit for one year so that you can make the repairs in one year. And let's say that line of credit is up to a million dollars. And after the, uh, after the one year, you took out 800000 So your $800,000 now that you owe converts to a term loan over, like, say, a five-year period at 3 to 4%, something like that. That's, what typ that's what's typical, but not... Not anything really above that number. And let me jump in. This might be a food for thought for future uh, commissioner, since again, we are aggressively looking for funds for loans for, for communities that, uh, that we represent. Um, it might be a good idea to have a future Zoom meeting and invite some people in the banking industry. Uh, I keep bringing up this Y Green because like I told you, they came out of nowhere and I'm shocked. They even talked about the potential of loans that may be up to 10 years, maybe 15 years. That would be a great asset. And finally, let's invite some of our congressional members, starting with Mrs. Wasserman Schultz and anyone else, because you know what? A lot of people depend on them. A lot of people vote. A lot of people need to, to hold them, you know, uh, uh, as I said, hold them up and, and, and make them responsible. I think that you can dedicate easily an entire show on funding, where do you go for money? Now, something along those lines, I think it would be very beneficial. That is an excellent idea. And I know um, Eric and I discussed, and I believe you were on the thread of having these monthly meetings on the second Tuesday of every month. So um, uh, maybe that's something that we can do, uh, we can schedule for, for March. I do wanna follow up at the end about how we can um, put a list together of emails and phone numbers for the folks on here today to um, 
contact all the uh, people up on the state level that make all of these um, decisions on our behalf. Absolutely. Um, okay, since this is being recorded, will this be presentation be available online? Yes, I'll put it up on my YouTube channel, but also encourage you to go to my Facebook page. If you just look up Commissioner Annabelle Taub Lima, you'll find me past, um, Zoom meetings are on there and I'll upload this one there as well. That's the easiest way um, to find them. Uh, so it'll be ready probably tomorrow, but I encourage you to go follow my page. Um, even though I, a commissioner in Hallandale, I really do update um, about legislation and the good work that Mr. Rabina does and Senator Rodriguez. So it'll all be um, topics that you don't have to live in Hallandale Beach, but you'll find useful. Um, so Miami becomes only for the wealthy. Um, <laughs> Pretty much if it continues to go the way it's going, only the rich will be able to afford real estate. In yeah. And the wealthier the building is, typically they're reserving. They're putting money away for reserve. Right. So right. they're okay. It's the poorer buildings, like always in life, right? It's the poorer people that are going to suffer the most by far when it comes to all this. I Which, why is it so important? Remember that Florida is a retiree destination. Yeah. Do you know that most Northerners come to Florida, they don't want to buy a home with a yard. They want to live on a condo and they love the coastal areas. Right now, it's not looking too attractive to some of the families that call this place home at their retirement age. So this is a major problem. It's just as bad in Central Florida as it is up in Northern Florida. Uh, it, it absolutely is. I actually do a lot of, I'm a real estate broker by day. I do a lot of work up in the Naples area, West and Central Florida, and it's, it's a prevalent um, issue and problem. So uh, I think that'll be another fight we're going to have to take on. <laughs> uh, my condo says, okay, um, I know there was a question regarding coastal. Somebody asked if they live in the intracoastal, is that considered coastal line? Probably. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. My condo association is saying that my the saying that my residences need to pay my residents need to pay thirty six hundred to five thousand a month for six months for forty year special assessment. They stated that we need two point six million dollars to start work, or the city county will condemn the building. I find it hard to believe that the county would do that to residents that are senior citizens on a fixed income or parents with children. The average person cannot pay 21,000 to 31,000 in six months. The property management company is threatening legal action if funds aren't paid, that will cause foreclosure. I want attention on this issue. They've scared the residents from going to Help Me Howard and Channel 7. This is Royal Palm and Plantation. Talk, talk to the people from Crestview if you don't think the municipality the building official will not throw you out of your, your, your unit. They did so in 15, they gave everybody, I think, 15 minutes to get out. Correct. So, yes. So while I don't think that's fair, yes, they will throw you out. Now, unfortunately in your condo, they seem to be hitting everybody with an unbelievable $4,000 a month for six months, basically special assessment. Whereas if they borrowed the money, they wouldn't have to do it this way. You know, your assessments would go up maybe $150 a month, but it would be for the next five years or so. You know, that's why a lot of associations are opting to borrow money instead. Let, and let me say one thing. Has everyone heard the word gentrification? Gentrification, of course. Okay, Explain so it let me tell you that don't understand what it is. Well, there's a lot of people that believe that there's all of a sudden this conspiracy where government is working to try to put all these violations to force these buildings to do everything because developers are going to the ones are going to make out like bandits. Eric, I'm sure you hear this. I'm laughing at you saying as you're telling it because I don't want, I'll let you talk and then I'll finish. Yeah. No, I'm just going to be brief that, that everyone's concerned. That what's going to happen is that we want to put down special assessments like that 4,000 for six months. Nobody can pay it. They'll be lean. They'll be foreclosed. And then developers are going to come in and buy up everything that's old and 40 years or older. They're going to knock it down and build again. What do you think about that, Eric? What do I think? You know, <laughs> some, 
sometimes, you know, people will stand up and say that on behalf of the Florida Bar, the bar recommends this. That's not the case. You have members of the Florida Bar that represent unit owners. You have members of the Florida Bar that represent associations. You have members of the Florida Bar that represent developers. And I can tell you uh, the members of the Florida Bar that are representing developers are licking their chops. And what they're hoping for is that, you know how you're allowed to terminate a condominium, but it normally requires like a 90% vote. What they would like to see is legislation passed that it would require only a majority vote, like 50% plus one. So that if the building needs $10 million in repairs, the developer could swoop in and say, okay, I'll buy your unit for pennies on the dollar, People, will, or else you're getting foreclosed on, so you better take my offer, right? Developer comes in, buys the building, everybody's out. So yes, there are attorneys right now who represent developers who are praying for exactly what Julio is saying. People deserve to hear it. They need to hear all this. It's important. It's the reality of it. Uh, Ms. Jacoby, buying and selling condos, no reserve. They won't get bank mortgages. That's um, exactly what we were talking about two minutes ago. FHA yeah. will not give a mortgage unless there's a reserve account out there. It's going to be impossible to get a mortgage if there's no reserves. Will be ca cash, cash buyers buying at a very discounted, reduced uh, price, unfortunately. Yeah, correct. Uh, but do sprinkler, sorry guys, but do sprinklers are really required in ELSS if there are different components in the ELSS, which do a similar job of saving people. That's um, we can't answer that. I love the fire inspector test can answer. Yes, that. I was just going to say I, I know who this group is, and I've already um, uh, responded to I guess one of your neighbors that I was going to forward your particular questions and concerns to our district fire chief in Hallandale Beach. So, uh, you know, follow. We can follow back up with me uh, tomorrow, but I'll be forwarding all of that. And I, I don't feel comfortable answering. I'm not the right person. And I think really the, the fire We're chief not. needs to look at that. Um, Ms. Jacoby, if the board members have never met the attorney, you'll have to uh, elaborate. What if the DBPR refuses to investigate due to attorney relationship with arbiters? The conflict. Yeah, mm -hmm. the conflict. You, well, you can ask for a different examiner or potentially uh, it, take the matter to court, get an independent judge. You know? Pay for it. Pay for it is exactly it. Pay for it. Yep. You use your money and the condo will use everybody's money. 32, 32 of the 37 reserve specialists are not licensed engineers or licensed architects. Only five of the 37 reserve specialists are licensed engineers or licensed architects. The bill requires that only licensed engineers or licensed architects can perform reserve study. The Miami-Dade County, Miami-Dade County Grand Jury and this bill doesn't reflect an understanding of who currently prepare, prepares reserve studies. I, I have a feeling I know who wrote this in quite frankly. And <laughs> the person is absolutely right. Um, I used to tell my son to become an attorney. Now I tell him to become a structural engineer. <laughs> you, have no, you have no idea. Julio, I don't know where we're going to get the personnel from. There's talk about um, granting permission from people who are licensed out of state to come to Florida. And let, just, like, just like what would happen during a natural disaster, where sometimes you can have people from other states come in and do the work. There's talk about that happening in Florida too, where you'd have you know qualified structural engineers from other states being allowed to do the work here because there's not even close to the number of engineers that we would need should this bill go through, not even close. It's even been disclosed, Eric, remember the town hall meeting we did in Doral? Yeah. We had the godfather, the guy who developed the yeah. thought of Pistorino. doing this inspection. Yeah. And Pistorino even told us that there isn't enough people to go around, but he had concern that even if you go off right now and your son becomes a structural engineer, he needs to have some experience. You just right. don't go right. out right out of college 
with no experience. That's why yeah. you understand the grand jury is taking it a little further, hoping that they will have actually designed and done yeah. more work, but you can't take a green person that right, right out of college and tell them to go and, and give you a, a right. good assessment of the structural condition of a building. That's not going to happen. Yeah, so that crazy. is going to be a problem. It is. Yep. It's definitely no going to be a problem. No question. So uh, to close this uh, session up for today, I, I, Janae Walker says, thanks for answering my question. I greatly appreciate, um, okay, now I missed it. But in any event, she was saying that she appreciates us answering her questions uh, and that she said it's unfortunate that the counties or cities are comfortable with having people um, being displaced. So let me let me touch up on that. I don't think that any municipal, any commissioner, county commissioner, I don't think anyone is comfortable with that. Um, I will say that it really depends on your leadership. So I'll say North Miami Beach got it wrong, but it wasn't the commissioners so much as the city manager who completely, uh, you know, got it wrong. Uh, should not be making this type of calls. But let me let me touch on Hallandale Beach. I don't believe you're a Hallandale Beach resident, but I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, our city manager, Dr. Jeremy Earl, and the director of the human services department, because we, we had a couple of buildings that we were concerned about. And one of the um, first concerns was, okay, if they were to be displaced, we need to help make arrangements for them. Can't just put them out on the street and certainly can't give them 15 minutes. So there's a very human aspect to it. And I think most cities and most counties want to get it right. Um, so, you know, I will say that, that depending on where you live, you should go and vote on ev every single election and local elections are the ones that impact your daily life most. So, uh, you know, I don't know where you live, but you're more than welcome to reach out to me uh, if I can um, assist you in any way uh, or answer more questions, I'll be happy to. Um, this was an excellent- Let me just say this, we wouldn't yeah. be here. We wouldn't be here. Like I said, remember I said when I was reading from the grand jury report, the one line that I couldn't believe, you know, that, that was so striking that they mm -hmm. cannot believe that there's legislation that allows a building to completely waive reserves they can't believe that that's actually in the condominium act and they're right so if the florida legislature would have addressed this 30 years ago right and, and said no you at least have to put some money away for a rainy day we're not going to let you waive everything we wouldn't be here today right. they would be in a much better position and annabelle if i may you know again being i know you do your job from the heart just like i do just like eric no elected person would ever want to cause harm to anybody in their community. What this is about, as drastic or as crazy it may sound, it's about saving lives. One yeah. life lost again is too much. And this is why they're going, you know, it's, it, it is. Some, some of this stuff, that's why it picks up the word knee-jerk reaction. Right. But we got to. We got to protect lives. That's it. At the end of the day, we're here to tell people what's going on. And by the way, Thank you, because I've watched your Zoom meetings continue to grow. Do you know that tonight at almost the whole entire, uh, you know, a Zoom meeting, you had over 100 people on here. Do you understand this is the power that I keep talking about? These folks need to try to get something going. If they're not in your community, do it in other communities. I know there's several mayors and other people that are considering following what you're doing here. If we can get this kind of, uh, of, of call it of, of, of a background of the way to get people to get on these Zoom meetings and become educated, things can happen. Things can really happen because the power is in the power of the vote and the ability to contact those who you elected, whether you voted for them or not, to get them to do what you want them to do. That's why the last thing I'll say is remember to put together, let's put together a list because people won't take the 30 seconds, even though they have a smartphone that they can Google and get their information, who their governor is and who's their speaker of the house and who's the president of the Senate. If we give it to them, they might opt to creating an email and having them sent. I remember I'd open up my, my laptop in the morning and I had three, 400 emails from my voters in my community over a subject that I really wasn't well versed on. Guess what I did? I read up on it and I went with the vote of what people wanted if that was, you know, their wish. That's called being a public servant. I'm done. 
Thank you. I look forward to that. And I look forward to the list of names. And hopefully everybody will get involved. This is serious. Time's ticking. You got less than a month and a half to, to, to try to see what comes out of this legislative session. All yours, guys. Well, it's always an honor to serve with you. Thank you. My pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Appreciate it. No, no, it. thank you. To, to close this real quick before you leave, uh, you had an incredible idea about having a, uh, a follow-up, but specific to funding. So I know we talked about uh, every second Tuesday of every month. But I'm wondering if we could put something together before that and then in that Zoom meeting also have some of the representatives and maybe Senator Anna Maria Rodriguez and, and have a list for people of who they can contact. Would I'll you... work with you on that. No problem. Okay. All right. So we'll see if we can put something together uh, maybe by the end of uh, February because time it really is ticking. So uh, my sincere gratitude to both of you, Representative Ravina, and uh, Eric, thank you very, very much. It's 8.21. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yep. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have you on uh, every, like we said, the second Tuesday of every month, hopefully. Um, all right. So thank, thank you, everyone. Um, you can look me up at um, Commissioner Annabelle Taub Lima on Facebook. Tomorrow I will post this Zoom meeting and um, look out for an announcement. We'll, we'll work out and hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we can have a follow-up specific to funding. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful night. Good night everyone. Everyone be well, take care. Bye-bye.